Well, let's look to the Lord in prayer. A loving Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you for your love for us. We thank you that it is a love that never fails. It is a love that pursues us even when we're running away from you. That it is a love that is unconditional and eternal. And so, Father, even though we will study a passage that seems very difficult, it seems like very harsh, and yet we know that behind this, this story is the loving hand of God in action. So we, we pray, Father, that we would see you, we would, as we see you, that we would glorify you for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have ever experienced seeing the check engine light go on on your, on your dashboard. Have you ever seen that, you guys? Okay, here's another quiz. Um, how many of you, when you see that, how many of you fix it right away? You go to a mechanic that same day or the following day, and you want to make sure that it's taken care of. How many of you do that? Okay. Three. Okay. <laughs> how many of you ignore it? Oh, the car seems to be going okay. Nothing's wrong. It's still accelerating. It's still braking, so it must be okay. It must be minor. How many just ignore it for a while? How many of you know people who they take a black marker and they just kind of <laughs> cover it up? You know people like that? No, not you. You know people like that who just cover it up? Now, what happens when you ignore a check engine light? After a while, your car begins to sputter. It might even die on the road, and you find out that had you taken it in earlier, the repairs wouldn't have been that expensive, but now you have to pay big bucks so that you can save your car, and so that you can get it working again, and if you continue to ignore the the warning light, sometimes that car becomes inoperable. You can't even fix it anymore. Warning lights are there to save your vehicle. In this passage that we read, David ignores God's warning lights. David ignores the fact that one of his servants said, this woman is married. And David was in such denial that when not only Uriah but other soldiers were killed... He writes a letter to Job and says, let not this thing be displeasing in your eyes. The word displeasing is the word evil. Don't let this thing seem evil to you because it doesn't seem evil to me. And yet at the end of that chapter, chapter 11, we hear God speaking. And he says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The same word, yara. It was evil in God's eyes. But David was in denial. And as a result of his denial, for about nine months, God's hand was heavy upon David. It says in Psalm 32, verse 3, as David was describing the intervening months from the time that he took Bathsheba to the time that Nathan the prophet comes, this is what he says. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. So appropriate. We all experienced that yesterday and maybe even today a little bit. He had no strength. Why? Because he was in denial and God's hand was heavy upon him. It was God's check engine light upon his life, but he ignored it. And so finally, God has to send Nathan the prophet. Last week, I told you that 12 times the word send occurs in chapter 11. One time it is attributed to Bathsheba when she sent a message to David to say that she is pregnant. Three times it is associated with Joab, but eight times it is associated with David. It says, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab. Verse 3, and David sent and inquired about the woman. Verse 4, so David sent messengers and took her. Verse 6, so David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. 
verse 12. Remain here today and also tomorrow, and I will send you back. In verse 14, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And in verse 27, and when the morning was over, David sent and brought her into his house. This passage, you find a king who was in total control of his kingdom. He had many servants under him. He was influential. He was powerful. He could just send this person here, send that person there. And it seemed like he was not accountable to anyone. But in verse 12, it says, the Lord sent Nathan. And he came to him and said, this passage, we find that there are grave consequences to sin. But that God loves you too much to let you get away with it. If you are a child of God, understand that God loves you so much that he will not allow you to get away with sin. He will send you a check engine light. And that you will ignore that at your peril. In this passage, you find five things associated with God sending Nathan the prophet. First of all, the confrontation from the Lord. At this point, David's heart was so hardened by sin that God had to slice through the layers of denial, the, the layers of deception. And he does it by sending him his friend Nathan. Nathan was David's friend. How do we know that? Because one of David's sons is named Nathan. When David wanted to build a temple for the Lord, who, whom does he consult with? Nathan, the prophet. And later on, we will see Nathan again coming back to David. And so this prophet from the Lord comes to David, David's close friend, and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. David, who was a judge over Israel, was used to hearing cases brought before him. And so he thought that his friend, Nathan, was just bringing another one of those cases that he had to adjudicate, that he had to make a judgment on. And he tells him a story about a rich man and a poor, poor man, and he describes the rich man first. The rich man had very many flocks and herds. In other words, he was very wealthy. In verse 3, but the poor man had nothing but one ewe lamb, which he bought. In other words, he was so poor, he had no animals. He had to save up so that he could buy a little lamb, one that would become a family pet. It says in verse 3, And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. They loved this animal. And, and David, who was a shepherd, could relate. He probably had delighted in playing with, with, with the lambs of his father's flock. It says, It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms and it was like a daughter to him. He treated like one of the members of the family. It was like a daughter to him. The word in Hebrew for daughter is the word bath. Does it remind you of anyone? Bath. She bath. <laughs> he treated it like one of his daughters. Now notice Nathan was very careful in how he chose the words. That he would use. He, he said this lamb would eat and drink and lie in the arms of the poor man. Do you remember last week when David confronted Uriah and said, why didn't you sleep with your wife? You've been gone for a long time. Aren't you a man? In other words, he was questioning his manhood. And remember the words that, that Uriah used in 2 Samuel 11, verse 11. Shall I then go to my house? To eat and to drink and to lie with my wife. So notice that Nathan, as he was bringing this case before David, cleverly chooses these words. But David wasn't aware. He, he thought that it was just a story. So in verse 4, he continues with the story. Now there came a traveler, this is where it gets interesting. Rich man, poor man, had a lot, had nothing. But there's, here's where the, the story turns. It says, and there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. 
but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Who is this traveler? I like the insight from Worsby. He says, the traveler whom the rich man fed represents the temptation and lust that visited David on the roof and then controlled him. If we open the door, sin comes in as us a guest, but soon becomes the master. It's not good. That when you entertain sin, when you allow it to linger, now it was, it's one thing for him to see a naked woman from the rooftop, but he could have turned around, but he, he allowed, he stared, and he allowed that, that view to, to, to be entertained in his mind, and he speculated, and so that the next day he went after her, he Instead of saying no and, and turning away this lust right away, what did he do? He enjoyed it. He entertained it. He welcomed it. That's why in the verse, in verse 4, you notice that the verb came comes, it's mentioned three times concerning this traveler. It says, now there came a traveler. The guest who had come to him. For the man who had come to him. What's the implication? It emphasizes the presence of the traveler. It shows that this was a persistent, ongoing temptation that David entertained. And instead of kicking him out the door, what did he do? He enjoyed the thought of sleeping with Bathsheba. And it got him in trouble. Verse 4, again. This rich man, going back to our story, the rich man does the unthinkable. Instead of sacrificing one of his many animals, what does he do? He took the poor man's lamb. He robbed, he stole from this poor man who only had one. Who treated this, this one like a pet, like part of the family. And he robbed the poor man. Verse 5. This got to David. David, who was a shepherd, it got to him. It, it, he could relate to the story, and he was furious. He says, then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives. I mean, David hadn't mentioned the name of the Lord for months. And all of a sudden, he got so angry. He mentions the name of the Lord, as the Lord lives. The man who has done this deserves to die. Ooh, David was tough. Verse 6. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing because he had no pity. <laughs> David was correct in the fourfold part because in Exodus chapter 22 verse 1 says, if a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. So he was right. He was correct. He shall repay fourfold. But this was not a capital offense. The man didn't deserve to die. You know, when, when you're not walking with the Lord, you're extra critical of people who are sinning, aren't you? When you're not experiencing God's grace, you don't show grace and mercy to other people, do you? And so here, David was, what's the, what's the word to use? He was over, overzealous in not only uh, assessing what the crime was, but in meeting out justice. In fact, it was, the crime didn't fit the punishment. And in one of the most dramatic, one of the most dramatic verses in the Bible, this is what Nathan says. He says, David goes, he deserves to die. Nathan looks him straight in the eye and says, David, you are that man. David, you are the rich man. David, you are the one that had an abundance of things. You have wives and concubines, and yet you took a poor man's wife, David. You are the man. Now, the text doesn't say, but you could just imagine David. You, you could just imagine David looking in, and wide-eyed and, you know, 
mouth open and maybe reeling back a little bit and, and, and thinking, I, I am that man. And before David could say anything, this is what God says. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Notice it, it mentions the fact that, that the Lord is the God of Israel. David might be the king of Israel, but the Lord was the God of Israel. And even though in those days monarchs were not accountable to anyone, David was accountable to the Lord, the God of Israel. And this is what he has to say. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. David, I have made you rich. I am the one that gave you your position. I am the one that protected you against impossible odds, against Saul's elite soldiers, 3,000 of them that came to you. You would not even be alive if it weren't for my deliverance and my protection. In verse 8, And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. David, I'm the one who gave you the, the, the possessions of Saul. I'm the one that gave you the prestige of being a king and that I gave you his harem. And I gave you his house. David, you did not have to do what you did. You did not have to take Bathsheba. And this is the saddest part. You know, when I read this, I just shake my head. It says, and if this were too little, <laughs> made you king. I gave you riches. I gave you, I gave you wives. I gave you a harem. David, I gave you all these things. But if that had been too little, if it wasn't enough, notice what God says. I gave you an open charge account. He says, I would have added to you as what? Much more. Not just, I would have added to you. David, you had a blank check. You could have asked any time, and I would have given it to you. Why? Why did you do what you did? Verse 9. What was so grievous about what David did? It says, why have you despised the word of the Lord? To do what is evil in his sight. Why did you show contempt for my word? Why did you treat my word so lightly? This same David who says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The same David who says, how can a young man keep his way pure by heeding God's word? What did David do? He despised the word of the Lord. Then it says, you have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonite. David, you might not have, have killed Uriah directly, but you did it, but you did it indirectly to the sword of the Ammonites. You told Job to put him at the front of the battle. You told Job to retreat from him so that he could die. It says, David, you are responsible for his death. That word despise is so important because it's the same word that's used of the worthless sons of Eli. It says, thus the sin of the young man was very great in the sight of the Lord for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt or they despise the offering of the Lord. And so what are the consequences? Here you find David with no choice but to plead, but to know that he was guilty. But then he had to hear the consequences. What are the consequences? There are consequences to sin. That if you, enjoy, that if you ignore the, the check engine light, understand that there are consequences to your sin. It says in verse 10, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. First thing that God says is your sons will die. David lost his first son with Bathsheba. David will later lose Absalom. He would lose um, Amnon, then Absalom, then Adonijah. Four sons. Why is it four? Remember what David says? He shall repay four times. 
And then it says, because you have despised me. Do you see the connection? When you despise the word of the Lord, when you disobey God's word, you are disobeying God. You are despising God. Why? Because God's word is a reflection of his character. It is a reflection of his will. And when you despise the word of God, you despise God. It says, why have you despised me? And again, he gives the charge. And have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Verse 11. Thus says the Lord. Here's the second part of the judgment. Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. There will be a rebellion in your house. And we will study that in the, in the weeks to come. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. It says, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before Israel and before the sun. In other words, David, what you did in darkness, I will do in broad daylight. What you did, did in secret, I will do out in the open. What happens? And just give you a preview of what happens in chapter 16. It says, so they pitch a tent for Absalom. This was his son who led a rebellion on the roof. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. The roof, the rooftop where David was, where he, who he first entertained that traveler, where he first gave in to his lust. He says, this will be the place where Absalom will one day do what David did in secret, out in the open, out in broad daylight. David heard the charge and, and the consequences. What would be David's response? Verse 13, And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. Notice David didn't give any excuses. He placed the blame squarely on his shoulders. I have sinned against the Lord. Da David didn't say, well, you know, in my defense, other kings do it all the time. He, he didn't say, um, I'm only human. You hear that excuse? David didn't say, well, you know, we were at war. I was under a lot of stress. I wasn't thinking correctly. What do you say? I have sinned. He called sin what it is. Sin. He didn't say, he didn't couch it in terms like, well, you know, it's an addiction. Or it's a weakness. Or it's a predisposition in my family. No, he called it sin. He says, I have sinned. He called sin, sin. And when we confess before the Lord, we need to call sin what it is. It's sin. Now, don't make excuses. Don't say, well, you know, I lost my temper, Lord, with my wife. But, you know, you know what she was doing. She was getting under my skin. And you start giving excuses. No. Call sin what it is. It's sin. He says, I have sinned. Now notice, against the Lord. It's interesting that, that when God was bringing the charge to David, the first thing is, you have despised me. And then he talks about the people whom David had hurt. And when David confessed, again, he sinned against a lot of people. He hurt a lot of people. But primarily he recognized that sin is primarily what? Against the Lord. Against his word. Against his commandment. Psalm 51, if you have time, read Psalm 51 because it is an expression, an expansion of what David meant when he said, I have sinned against the Lord. Psalm 51 says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. In verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your word and blameless in your judgment. So David was not only confessing his sin. David was saying, Lord, you have perfect right to do whatever you want to do with me. It was David's way of saying, Lord, I accept the consequences for my actions. But if you read Psalm 51, don't miss 17. Because there's the word that we've been, we've been talking about. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not, here's the word again, despise. 
David despised the word of the Lord. David despised the Lord himself. But he says, when I come before you with a humble heart, God, you will not despise me. The God who was despised will not despise you if you come to him in repentance. Oh, the grace, the riches of God's grace. The wonderful mercy of God. Now, I, I like what Psalm 103 verse 10 says. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. See, God, God could have just, just killed David. For his sins. And yet God out of love. God out of compassion. Out of mercy. Sends Nathan to convict David. To show David. Where he has gone wrong. Verse 13. And, David, and Nathan said to David. The Lord also. Has put away sin. You shall not die. Isn't it interesting. David's offense. Was a capital offense. Twice. Exodus 21, 12. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. He killed Uriah. He deserves death. Leviticus 20, 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulterers shall surely be put to death. David himself, in adjudicating the case, pronounced death on himself. But God forgave. It says, David, you shall not die. In verse 14, nevertheless, because this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. This, this bothered me when I was studying this passage. This bothered me because I was thinking, what did the child do wrong? The child didn't do anything wrong. As I was studying, I think the, the words from um, the Expositor's Bible Commentary kind of explained it to me. He says, when David slept with the woman and created new life, the woman did not belong to him but to Uriah. The child cannot belong to David. He cannot enrich himself through his sin. And in a sense, justice is done to Uriah. That kind of explains it. That this child doesn't belong to David and therefore he cannot keep this child. It wasn't a judgment on the child. It was a judgment on David. It says in verse 15, then Nathan went to his house, and the Lord afflicted the child that, that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. Even before Uriah, I mean, um, even before Nathan got home, what happened? The child got sick. God struck the child. Why? Because of David's sin. So David cried to the Lord. David cried to the Lord. And in this cry, you, you see the heart of David once again. That, that heart that's been so callous, didn't care about the deaths of soldiers. All of a sudden, you find David's heart tender once again. Because God has, has, has pierced through the layers of deception, the layers of denial. It says in verse 16, David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him. To raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. David was so heartbroken that he, he would not eat for a week. And he just fasted for the child. He prayed for the child. He pleaded with God. You know, as sad as, as this section is, it's kind of refreshing because all of a sudden you see David again dependent on the Lord. You see David once again fellowshipping with the Lord. You see David once again praying to the Lord. Months and months and months of being out of fellowship with the Lord. Now David once again is conversing with this God. Communing with this God. Verse 18. On the seventh day, the child died. God said no. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, The child is dead? He may do himself some harm. They were afraid for David's safety. Verse 19, But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood 
the child was dead. David, ever the, the perceptive king, understood what had happened. And David said to his servants, is the child dead? They said, he is dead. David pleaded with God. And David said no. And God said no. Whenever, whenever God says no to your prayers, the proper response is not to ask why. It is to worship. It is to worship. When God says no to your prayer, the proper response is not to say, God, why did you do that? It is to worship. It is to understand that God is a holy God and God is a loving God. And he always does what is best for all. He is a compassionate God that in the midst of his discipline, God demonstrated his love to David. Verse 20, then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. He then went to his own house. And when he, he asked, they set food before him and he ate. Notice, what did David do? He worshiped. He went to the house of the Lord and worshiped. For the first time, we see David once again enjoying the, the, the joy of his salvation. Once again, in the presence of of his Lord. It says he changed his clothes. In, in the Bible, changing of clothes means a new beginning. Maybe some of you are, are here today and you, you're feeling that, Pastor, that's, I've been out of fellowship with God for a while. I'm here to tell you that God could give you new clothes. I'm here to tell you that today could be a new beginning for you, just as it was a new beginning for David. That no matter how far away you are from God, that there is no sin where God's grace is not deeper still. And that you, you could once again fellowship with this holy and loving God if you will repent of your sins. It says he went, it says he, he went to his house and when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. Notice that he worshiped even before he ate. His hunger and thirst for God was greater than his, than his hunger and thirst for food. That he worshiped before anything else, and then he ate. Verse 21, and th this is where we receive so much hope in this passage. He received comfort from uh, the, his, his, the presence of God, but, but also notice what it says in verse 21. Then his servants said to him, what is the thing that you have done? You have fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. They couldn't understand. They were confused. David. Why did you cry when, when the child was still alive? Now you're not crying. You're eating food. This is what David says. While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. What is the comfort? The comfort is that with people who have passed on, that we will see them again. If a child dies in his age of innocence, the Bible says, I believe that that child goes to heaven. We get confirmation of that in, from Jesus' lips in Matthew 19. But Jesus says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And so I believe David was teaching here that when children die in their age of innocence, that we will see them again. And that was a comfort to David. Um, what else? In verse 24, it says, Then David comforted his wife, Bathsheba, and went into her and lay with her. And she bore a son, and he called him his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. Amazing. That the Lord not only forgave, that he took the curse of this relationship, he took the curse off this marriage, and he once again blessed this marriage. Notice the words. David comforted his wife, Bathsheba. It was no longer Uriah's wife. That when God forgives, he totally forgives. And even though we might say, well, no, David, David, you can't bless David that way anymore. God says, no. If I say I've forgiven him, I've forgiven him. And to show us that, what does he do? He gives him a son, Solomon. Not only Solomon. Who, who is Solomon going to be? He's going to be in the line of Messiah. 
and then the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, and he called his name Jedediah because of the Lord. Jedediah, the word Jedediah means loved by God, God's beloved. And so Solomon has two names. The word Solomon means peaceable from the word shalom. And his other name, his pet name from Nathan is Jedediah. Jedediah. Comfort from fellowshipping once again with the Lord. Comfort of seeing his child again someday. Comfort of having a newborn son, Solomon. And then comfort of victory. It says in verse 26, Now Joab fought against Rabbah of the Ammonites and took the royal city. It took Joab almost a year to beat the Ammonites. Was it because the Ammonites were great soldiers? No. It was because David's sin was keeping the nation from being blessed. And so in verse 26, after David confessed, God not only lifted his heavy hand upon David, God lifted his heavy hand upon the nation so that the nation could once again experience victory. When you see a check engine light in your life, it is God not only warning you to save you from further heartaches, it's God warning you so that he could bless you once again. He is drawing you close to him so that you could be in a position where you can once again be blessed by him. What happened in verse 29? So David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. He was once again victorious. He was once again where he needed to be. The beginning of chapter 11, when kings went off to war, David stayed. At the end of chapter 12, David went to war and captured Rabbah. He was once again where he needed to be. This whole story, chapter 11 and chapter, chapter 12, has been to, to comfort the afflicted. If, if you're those who have strayed away from the Lord, it is to, to bring you back and say, God, God loves you. God wants to bless you once again. But you need to repent of your sins. But it's also a great warning. It is also a great warning that even though God forgives, there are consequences to sin. And if you're tempted, what you need to do is look beyond the temporary pleasures of that sin and look to the consequences that will follow. You want to know the problem with a lot of sexual fantasies? They don't go far enough. Because we don't think what happens a week later, what happens a month later, what happens a year later, what happens to my reputation, what happens to my ministry, what happens to my family, what happens to the family of the other person, but most of all, what happens to the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not focus on the momentary pleasures of sin. Yes, there is momentary pleasures, but only for a season. Look ahead to the consequences. This story is both a comfort if you've fallen, that God can restore you. But it's a warning if you have not fallen, that don't even go there. That even before you go there, God would flash a check engine light in your life. And you need to pay attention. Because if you ignore it, you ignore it to your own peril. This passage, we see the confrontation by the Lord. David, you are that man. The consequences from the Lord. The sword will not depart from your house. What you did, did in secret, it will be done in the open. The confession to the Lord. I have sinned before the Lord. The cry to the Lord. God said no, and David worshiped. And finally, the compassion from the Lord. God can once again began to bless the life of David. Even though David's life would never be the same, God's curse upon his marriage was lifted and he was once again able to, to receive the blessings from the Lord. God forgives me when I repent and loves me during times of discipline. God forgives me when I repent and loves me during times of discipline. It took the slaughter of a lamb 
for David to realize the gravity of his sin. And it takes the death of a lamb for, for us to realize just how sinful we are before a holy God. Isaiah 53 says, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. When Jesus came to earth, this is the ver- with this verse I'll close, John the Baptist says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A holy God must punish sin, but a loving God must save the sinner. Have you experienced this forgiveness of sins? Would you like to? Let's pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if today you've come and you're under a heavy weight of sin and shame, Jesus died to forgive you of those sins. He died to save you. He died so that you could have fellowship with the Holy God. And so in the quietness of this moment, if you'd like to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, would you would just follow me in a simple prayer that expresses that desire just quietly where you're at in your heart and mind to say, Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins was buried, and the third day rose again. I hear and now put my faith in you alone as my Lord and as my Savior. Come into my heart and cleanse me of my sins. Come into my heart and save me. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. Father, thank you for anyone who prayed that prayer. And I pray, Father, that you would help them to grow in their faith in you. Maybe you're a believer and you've been ignoring the warning lights in your life for months. And maybe, just maybe, God is speaking to you right now. And he's telling you to stop covering it up. Stop ignoring it. And come clean before him. And if you would do that right now, the Bible says that if you confess your sins, that God is faithful and just to cleanse you from your sins and all other unrighteousness. So if you would come before him right now just to do business with him, would you do that as the Spirit leads? If the Spirit is speaking to you, just say, Lord, I have sinned before you. Forgive me. Father, I thank you for the convicting work of the Spirit. Forgive us, Lord, for for the many times we ignore him. Forgive us, Lord, for the many times we despise your word, the many times we despise you. I thank you, Lord, that your sacrifices are broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, Father, you've said, you will not despise. And so we thank you, Lord, for that promise. And we ask, Father, that you would work in each heart that we would leave this place renewed, refreshed, knowing that we have been forgiven, not because of anything we've done, but because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Remind us, Lord, remind us of that great love as we partake of communion. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time...